In the New York civil fraud case, Trump has already suffered a series of losses in the last week. The gag order to stop the Trump side from bashing the judge's law clerk is reinstated by an appeals court. Trump's team got basic appeal procedure wrong to obtain a fast track appeal to the highest court and put a fork in it. The defense case is about over with Trump and Eric electing not to testify again for the defense, sensing I am sure that they will be on the losing end of the civil fraud case come January. We break it down. Jack Smith has informed the trial judge in D.C. election case that he intends to use Trump and his co-conspirators words and actions against them at trial with special 404B evidence to show common plan, intent, lack of mistake and to prove Trump's criminal intent. We break it down. What is 404B? You'll know at the end of this podcast. The federal civil defamation jury trial in the District of Columbia against unindicted co-conspirator number one, formerly known as Rudy Giuliani, starts in about 10 days. Why is the trial only about damages? And how big a check will the jury write for election workers Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss? Why is this a jury trial at all instead of the judge just deciding? Why is Rudy the only remaining defendant? And why is the judge so annoyed at Rudy and his lawyer we discuss? Finally, now that Ken Chesbro, disgraced Trump lawyer and Georgia felon, has likely testified to the grand jury in Nevada, we have new indictments of fake electors there, including the former heads of the GOP in Nevada, joining Michigan and soon Arizona. We discuss all this and so much more at the corner of law, politics, and justice on the midweek edition of the Legal AF podcast with Karen Friedman Ignifolo and me, Michael Popak. Karen, I got a, I got a question for you. Yes. Are you thinking of launching a yet another edition of Legal AF? The ladies edition? Well, I've seen that. Is it though? Does that that sounds like the NBA versus the WNBA? We're all peers, but I is it true? You and Dania Perry? Uh we're 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 testing the waters. We're, you know, doing a oh, few here and there. You know, we're it's we'll, so, we'll see. We'll see. The restaurant's you know, doing now, a soft opening. For Friends now, and family only. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I love how far we've come in the last few months. Remember when we used to say Ken Cheesebro and now we say Chessbro? I mean, I, I'm bro. so impressed, you know, how far Very we've evolved. But, all, but of our, our audience, we got, oh, I can't tell you how many criticisms we get. We get, we get great support from the audience. Let me, let me lead with that. That's the better headline. We get tremendous tremendous beautiful support you know we share with each other when we catch something in a chat or in an email or a text one of us gets that that is complimentary because it helps balance off some of the other trolling that happens but occasionally we get criticized for grammar or we pronounce states names wrong or names of people wrong and all i can say is i don't know it's uh, we're trying it's we're like a garage band we're doing the best we can on the limited budget we've been provided to bring you th that analysis in real time as quickly as we can and sometimes we make mistakes but we're human i guess what people like about the show speaking of humans <laughs> that's a great segue speaking of humans let's talk about the new york civil fraud case and uh let me frame it and then punt it over to my illustrious partner uh, in this uh, all things uh, law. I always said crime, partner in crime. Partner in law in order would be better. Uh, Karen Friedman, Ignifolo. So Donald Trump didn't like that he got gagged and his lawyers got gagged because he likes to bash in a misogynist way, doesn't care that the he puts somebody's life in jeopardy, the principal law clerk that works for the judge. There's no other way to put it. He must get up in the morning and brush his teeth and think, how can I attack this poor civil servant on a daily basis, accuser of crimes and being unethical um, because I'm losing in the courtroom. And when he got gagged, like enough, put a sock in it, you know, show some decorum, you know, you know, show some respect for the dignity of the process uh, and, uh, and, and all of that. You know, he, he was um, happy for about a minute when they were successful in getting a um, administrative, uh, like a duty judge, a duty judge that's assigned uh, to take in on appeal any kind of emergency relief. And they got, they, they pulled Justice Friedman again. And Justice Friedman, 
was, has been wrong twice related to Donald Trump and said, yeah, I'm going to stay the gag order until the full merits panel of the first department appellate division can rule on it. I'm not sure I see anything wrong with attacking the law clerk. And we were like, what? And so that just led Letitia James to send in pages and pages and pages of declarations and affidavits and exhibits showing how the, the threat assessment has gone up so terribly against Ju uh, Judge Angoron and against the principal law clerk um, that the Department of Public Safety has had to intervene and protect them. And uh, then a, a four-judge panel, full merits panel, four justices of the Appellate Division First Department reversed what the uh, Judge Friedman had done and reinstated the gag order both on Donald Trump and his lawyers. While in the background, we still wait for the D.C. Court of Appeals in the criminal case there to decide whether Judge Chutkin's gag order is uh, should be upheld. Uh, and so all these things are going on at the same time. So that was the result. And then why don't you take it from there? Um, there's been reporting about how clueless Chris Keis and Cliff Robert are, and I mentioned this in a hot take that I did, about just basic appellate procedure and how it works down at the first department as they showed up breathlessly at the clerk's office trying to get their paper, papers filed, which were bounced, uh, to get to the higher court, the Court of Appeals in New York on the issue. And in the meantime, going back to the trial judge, Judge Angoron, um, because the case, I, I've spent uh, seven minutes, six and a half minutes talking about everything except for the merits of the case, which is sort of what Donald Trump wants. Uh, I've just been talking about the law clerk and gag orders, and I have, and it's taken away valuable time to talk about what's going on in the courtroom in a civil fraud case where a judge holds Donald Trump's business future and past and dollars in his hand. So why don't you take it from there, Karen, and fill everybody in about what you observed and where do you think this goes from here as we move into a closing argument in January? Well, we're deep into the defense case, right? The the um, the prosecutor rested. They've had over, I think, 45 trial days at this point, and we're in the, I think, fourth week of the defense case. And they have been putting on witnesses, a lot of experts and bankers and, and various individuals. And it was widely expected that Eric Trump was going to come back as well as Donald Trump were going to come back and testify on their case in chief, their, their defense uh, their defense case. And, you know, for, for people who aren't familiar with civil law and how it works, and I'm new to it, so I find it fascinating how different it is from criminal law. You know, you might say, well, I don't understand. Didn't Eric and Donald already testify? Why would they be coming back? And the way it works in civil cases and not in criminal cases, this is completely different and opposite, is you can't call the opposing counsel in a criminal case, or the opposing party, I should say, in a criminal case on your direct case, because they'll take the fifth. They have a Fifth Amendment right against uh, incriminating themselves. And so it, it's not done ever. And they would testify if they want to put on a defense and then they would waive, you know, but that's their own choice. So, so they'd be waiving their Fifth Amendment privilege. And then the prosecutor cross-examines them. Well, in civil cases, it's fascinating because they have depositions already. So they've already questioned them. They know what they're going to say. Again, in New York, you don't have criminal depositions. And you, and so you can make a decision whether or not you want to put them on the stand and, and you would essentially cross examine them because by law, they are hostile because they are a party opponent. And so, so. I found it fascinating that they were cross-examined, but then their lawyers didn't uh, didn't talk to them or speak to them or ask them questions. And I asked you about that and you educated me that, uh, and I appreciate it very much, that the reason that's done is because they wait until, and they tell their side of the story and what they wanna say on their case, because when there's a, a motion to dismiss at the end of the government's case, you don't wanna have added to that by providing evidence, right? You wait until your case. And so, so that's where we are. And so everybody's expected that they would come back and and give their side of the story and, and testify the way Don Jr. did 
when he gave his um, Trump organization television commercial and touted all the various properties and, you know, talked about how great they are and, and fawned over his father, who he called a, a genius uh, and and his his ability to work with, you know, work with real estate and transform it was like watching an artist work. I mean, it was just one of these like gag me moments, you know, that uh, happens sometimes in trials. And, and but apparently, um, what happened was they they asked they asked Judge Angoran to delay their testimony until after the appellate courts rule on this gag order that you were just talking about the gag order that they are appealing and Judge Angoran turned to the government and said what do you think and they said no way and Judge Angoran said no way and so Eric so far has chickened out and decided not to testify. Um, and I, I, all the reading I've done is that Trump is still scheduled to testify on December 11th, although I know you did a hot take saying you don't expect him to testify uh, given this information. Do you have other information that, that, that I haven't been able to find? Yeah, I think the, the reporting that I'm seeing is that Trump's not testifying again. But uh, Donald, I mean, um, especially now that they've ruled that he can't appear. I, I, I still, for the life of me, don't understand why the gag order preventing him from bashing that's all that's all that i want to be clear here the gag order in the district of columbia is broader that has to do with targeting witnesses co-defendant well, there's no co-defendants in dc witnesses and members of the criminal justice team prosecutors their staff investigators and the like and targeting them in social media and in other statements by donald trump or his proxies ones that he's, he controls. This one's even narrower. This isn't a civil case. Don't bash, dox, attack, talk about the functions of or the behavior, the conduct of my law clerk. And to be clear, I am not here suggesting that if Donald Trump or his team had a legitimate appellate appeal, reversible error type issue, that they shouldn't have the right to preserve the record and make a record for the appeal. The way that we'll have a little legal AF breakout session on appellate practice. At the trial level, where the record is made, that's the record meaning the judge's rulings, the evidence, the testimony, the transcript of the hearings and the trials and all of that comprised and the, and the filings, the pleadings and other, other discovery and other, inf other things that are on the docket of the case, so to speak, are comprise the record. That becomes the record on appeal that gets transmitted to whatever appellate court is the next stop on the train. It literally gets transmitted, the entire package. It gets numbered one through whatever the last page when you stack it up in one big pile. So joint appeal appendix or, or appendix, you know, one to 5,000. That's how it's referred to in briefing. And you send it to the appeals court. And if you have an issue that you want to preserve for appeal, you mention it at trial to give the trial judge the first opportunity to make the decision, because that's what you're supposed to do, to preserve it. And if the judge rejects your position, you can go further and make a proffer about what the evidence that's been, or the issue that you're being precluded from talking about would have shown, and you can make a proffer. Not for the judge who's probably already made up their mind, but for the appellate court. And you can point to that. I made a record. The record, they made a record. It's now become what I called in a hot take, a broken record about the principal law clerk. We got it. You think she's Chuck Schumer's girlfriend. You think that she's, because she's a Democrat, she can't be fair. You think because in response to ridiculous arguments being raised by Alina Haba, the lawyers or Donald Trump, and she rolls her eyes or huffs or puffs, that that indicates reversible error. Um, that she's doing her job as the principal law clerk, um, handing notes and assisting the judge at the trier of fact in a 10-week, 12-week, 14-week trial where he has to keep everything straight in his head and in the record. Great. You made the record. That doesn't mean, first of all, not only does it mean that you have to keep raising the issue every time. Oh, another note, another eye roll, another comment, another, another social media post by the law clerk. You made the record. And to do it after the record has been made, which was it was made a long time ago, five, six weeks ago, then it just becomes abusive, unethical conduct by people that are supposed to be uh, officers of the court in a courtroom. And that's where we are now. We've crossed past 
well past the line of making a proper record, if that was their intention, into the world of abusive, harassing conduct that has no place in the court system of New York. And that's what the appellate court has been saying by reinstating the gag order. I don't know what that has to do with Donald Trump or Eric Trump or anybody's decision to testify or not. They're just looking for an excuse not to testify. Because the, obviously, now we're in minute 15 of our podcast talking about what's going on inside. It's not going well. Experts for Donald Trump that have no basis, in fact, in the record of the case or in relevancy tied to issues about materiality, intentional fraud, and and um, the amount of the ultimate recovery by the people if they prevail. They have nothing to do with it. M most of those people were destroyed by their own reports uh, in cross-examination. So take the Trump experts off the board. The, the, the bankers didn't help him either. He promised Trump, you'll see my bankers. Deutsche Bank loves me. They love me. They love giving me money as much as I want, regardless of how much I have in the bank. Wrong. You have a disconnect and a mismatch between the front of the house and the back of the house in a bank. The front of the house is the banker. They're salespeople. They're just selling all day long. They go on golf trips and junkets. They take their clients to Scotland to go play Lynx courses. Look it up. <laughs> and they you know, shower them with gifts and presents and all, because they just want the business. I want the biz. The back of the house has compliance <laughs> and underwriting requirements and review of assets and due diligence requirements in order to run a bank. And the, and the underwriters are the ones, not the bankers, are the ones that set the amount that they want as security and pledge collateral for a loan. We want $2.5 in um, net worth, real net worth, not cookbook net worth. We want $500 million in liquid assets. And that's what you have to have. It's binary. You either have that number or you don't. Except in Trump world, when you don't have that number, when your real balance sheet is closer to one billion, which we'd all love, I wouldn't want that sucked out of my bank account. <laughs> but but that's the one billion. It's not two and a half. So that would limit the amount of money that he'd be able to get from a Deutsche Bank. So I, we're not here to suggest that Deutsche Bank's bankers didn't love him. I'm sure they did. He was a whale. If you're if you're a billion or more, you're a whale. The question is, are you Moby Dick? You're, are you two and a half times that in order to get the money that they were given? And that is the issue they keep missing. It's like they're putting on two different cases, which is, you which is, uh, is let me just finish that point, then I'll turn it over to you, which is, which is terrible for Donald Trump because the case that matters is the civil fraud case and the amount of the remedy dollar amount that's going to be awarded by this judge. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, um, what I thought was interesting or weird was the the bankers who testified, the Deutsche Bank bankers said, look, you know, financial statements are estimates, you know, so as a result, we do our own due diligence. And in fact, here, we adjusted the numbers downward. He, we adjusted it from 4.9 billion to 2.6 billion. Doesn't that prove the fraud? Didn't he just <laughs> say, uh, you know, because it's not, it's, it's about the fact that, you know, that they submitted false fraudulent documents. I was like, that to me is the proof right there. Right. The, the, the delta between we gave Donald Trump a haircut off the number he gave us. But the problem is the number was so high that the haircut wasn't deep enough to match the act. Right. Isn't that your point, Karen? To match the actual $1.5 exactly. billion dollar net worth. He didn't have 2.7. He didn't have 4.5. He had one point something, if you were honest about the value of Mar-a-Lago, the Trump Tower, 40 Wall Street, and all the other pieces of property that make up his balance sheet. And that, that's what the, some people might be tuning in late might be thinking, is that what this case is about? This is exactly what this case is about. The statements of financial condition reflecting the assets that Donald Trump can claim ownership of, and what if the numbers were true or false. It's easy. You know, if you go pull the balance sheet for Microsoft, for Apple, for name your favorite company in America, it's relatively easy. There are There's cash on hand, there's assets that are valued under generally accepted accounting principles, which, is, which, which have due diligence as part of it because there's auditors that are involved, not auditors that, that leave the scene screaming, we can't trust the numbers of our client, but real auditors. And therefore the public in making investment decisions can rely on them. And that's why we don't have cases where a major company in America is cooking the books.
we do in a mom and pop shop, basically a family business, which is all this is, a family office, which all which which is all this is. That's a thing that's a New York thing, right, Karen? Family offices. Yes, exactly. So it's many a New people York work. Thing. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot right. of people who work for family offices. All that means that's code for we're rich, we have a lot of money, and we have an office and we invest our money and you know take care of our properties and our various holdings. And you know, that's the yeah. family office. And, and, and right, and the family office that, that this is just a glorified family office. The way that the way that that's run, and they didn't have the controls in place. This is my family office, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is my office. <laughs> this this um, th- they didn't have the con- when the family office in the Trump world doesn't have the controls in place to be a legitimate business, and that's why persistent fraud is often found in places like that, and not in places like publicly traded companies, because publicly traded publicly traded companies don't have all their executives with their last name same last name, and they actually take their position seriously, um, and they are control officers, and they know what that means, and they're skilled, qualified, and trained to, to run that, uh, to run those operations, those different operational parts of that. That's not here. Because that's not what Donald Trump wanted. Donald Trump wants to wake up in the morning and go, I'm a five billionaire. Let's go borrow money today. Get my guys on the phone. Um, I mean, and that that's fine until you get a New York attorney general and combined with the most uh, robust series of laws in this, I would argue, in all 50 states to go after persistent fraud exists in New York uh, since 1956, which is the 63-12 executive law that we're under right now. So let's say Trump comes back. All right. So th- is there any, do you have any, what's your, what's your view about, um, what are the, what are the odds? So let's do odds making here. What are the odds in your mind that Donald Trump prevails on any of the remaining six counts and or is able to limit the amount of money that is taken away from him and companies dissolved when the trial is all over through Judge Engel. Uh, so I think after the government puts on a rebuttal case, if any, and Judge Engoron has his here's the closing arguments in mid-January and then gives his decision that will likely be written, uh, I believe he is going to throw, I I think he's going to acquit, if that's the right word, um, on at least one charge. I really do think, especially now that you've got all these bankers saying that it didn't make a difference, we didn't rely on them, we did our own due diligence. And the reason I think Judge Ngoron is going to do that is because Trump's entire appeal is going to be based on the fact that Judge Ngoron was biased, that he's partisan, a best law clerk, that he wasn't listening, he didn't have an open mind, that he was 100% had his mind made up, that he didn't listen to the evidence. And the perfect way to inoculate that and immunize that argument is to show that he did listen to the evidence and he didn't just give the government everything that they wanted. And so if he doesn't give them the remaining six charges. A, I don't think that makes a difference one way or another. In ter- they've already found the big charge, right? The big, the big one, and the damages I think are going to be significant. In addition to monetary damages, it, it's going to be a huge, huge, huge penalty. But I also think he's not going to be able to uh, do business in the state of New York anymore. He's going to have to sell off many of his uh, or dissolve many of the LLCs or other other. Um, other companies that he's set up that that hold many of the licenses and the businesses uh, that he has here in New York. That that's my prediction of how it's going to go. What about you? Yeah, I know. I we we. I just want to check in with you. It's very similar to what we said a few weeks ago, um, but now having seen more evidence, I wanted to see if your position changed. I, I think you're right. I think that there's enough evidence, um, and and on the lower scale, not criminal, a preponderance of the evidence for Letitia James and the people of the state of New York to prevail on everything remaining. But you, why not? Why not throw him a bone and and suss out maybe the in, the remaining counts are insurance fraud, um, books and records fraud, uh, which are all crimes, by the way, uh, financial statement fraud, and conspiracies around those things, uh, those three things. And so, sure, throw him a bone. I think it'd have to be because the conspiracy and the underlying count issue. I think he'd have to throw two bones. So maybe he says, "I don't really see the insurance fraud." If if there were one, if I were to pick one from the Karen Friedman Ignifolo world, which I agree with, I think he he may toss the insurance one. 
because again, that's the one, there's not a lot of damage there. There's not a dollar yeah. amount that could be disgorged from insurance, but it does give him, like you said, that prophylactic insulation from being said, well, how biased was I? I dropped one of your counts, yeah. you know, and all of that. And so uh, uh, th we're going to keep watching, I think, without any of the Trumps testifying, even if Donald comes back. I think the case is about baked. There may be a short rebuttal case the way it works, as Karen alluded to it. Petitioner, plaintiff, state went first then, and they went for a long time, 25 witnesses, thousands of pages of documents and exhibits, hundreds of thousands of pages. Then the, we, we bid in the defense case for the last several weeks. And then at the end, the attorney general gets the last word and they decide to put on what's called a rebuttal case. They can. I've done them. It depends. It, I'm of two minds. You never want to give up the opportunity of the final word. But if you think oh, we've been here, it's exhausting. We've been here for 12 weeks it's, and we weren't really damaged because the rebuttal would have to literally be a rebuttal to what you just heard in the defense. And the experts were terrible for Donald Trump. The bankers weren't any better. Um, you know, even when they put McConney on to cry his way through his testimony or uh, Patrick Bernie, I'm surprised he's still employed, uh, who said that he was told by, you know, Weisselberg for Donald Trump to change the numbers. Uh, what, you know, what, what are you going to rebut? Um, but they could. They may take a day to do a quick rebuttal. If they have case. someone from Deutsche Bank, if they have someone from they Deutsche could. Bank on the other side of, of the fence, that could they be could. pretty crushing. You could bring in rebuttal. You could bring you. You're right. You could bring in rebuttal witnesses, unless you feel like you're gilding the lily. You and I have done this. If you think you're way up on points, although it's never enough, because you never know. Especially, I don't in, know. In I would world. still do it just to sh just to show that yeah. it's not true. I, I just for me, I. But again, I'm used to having to prove my case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. And so right. you got to run know, up that's the points. I, yeah. Yeah. You you definitely have to run up the points with on that theory. But you also have a slightly frustrated and gore on, you know, look, eight weeks ago, before they started the trial, it's hard to believe, beginning of October, and Goron turned to the New York Attorney General's lawyers the day after he granted summary judgment in their favor and said, do we really even need a trial? <laughs> like, I'm ready to go to remedy. And they said, no, Judge, we think we have to try all six of the counts and we're and because the remedies that we're asking for are drastic and we got to make a record. Okay. But I, I agree think with that. He'd like the lawyers to shut their pie holes and let him start writing his order. I think he's already written a lot of his order and do the oral argument and then hit print. And as I joked in a hot take, I've, I'm sure you have too, or maybe not yet. I've finished oral arguments and then have the judge go, okay, here's my decision. Like, wow. <laughs> Didn't change a word for when we started arguing. Um, oh, they yeah. rip, it off, rip it off and hand it to you. So uh, he may not do that, although he's quick. You know, they, they got on him about the summary judgment uh, being ordered. They went to a court, appellate court to force him to, to both rule on the summary judgments and delay the trial to give him more time. And six hours later, he issued his 30-page order on summary judgments and said, see you Monday for trial. And so he's, this is already written. I would say right now, three quarters of this order one way or the other is written already by the judge. And it's all, well, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. We'll see what happens the last week or well, so. It, make, it makes sense because a lot of it's going to be, you know, the facts, the allegations, this is the prosecutor, the plaintiff's case, this is the defense case. I mean, a lot of it summarizes it. So as you go, it makes sense that he would, you know, populate it with things that happen as it's going in his, in and, his, in his order. And you know who's populating it? The principal law clerk and her exactly. staff. Exactly, of course she is. <laughs> Yeah, she has a job. I know people think they, they, they've made her into such a cartoonish figure as they attack her and body shame her and misogynist and anti-Semitic and sexist and all of that. She's got a job to do. And every day she goes through the record at the end of the day and she points and marks the places in the transcript that is going to end up in the order. You know, it's just mind boggling to me. And it's also mind boggling that they're, they, they can't find the lawyers for Donald Trump who are not in, who are not New York lawyers by training? I'm sorry, they're just not. They can't find their they can't find their butt with two hands. They just they they are just they run down to to the first. I've run down to the first department. They run down to the first department and they get <sighs> with Chris Kais all frustrated with the clerk. We're here. We're here to file an emergency. We want a, a one judge. Yeah, they want the one judge again. One judge justice to to let us expedited go to the Court of Appeals of New York on the gag order. 
And the lawyer, the, another courtroom staff, because the principal law clerk's a lawyer too, the lawyer for the first department comes out and says, yeah, but that's not procedurally correct. You go, well, what do you mean? There's got to be a way. He says, yeah, it has to go to the full four justice panel that just ruled against you and they have to decide. You can't get an emergency judge right now to just pull him out and sign the order. Oh, what do you mean? He got all the, the reporting was he got people went down there and reported on this. And Chris got all upset. Chris is always upset in this case. He's upset with the judge. He's it's a travesty. It's a travesty of justice. We can't bash the law clerk. I assure you, never in his 30-year career in Florida as a lawyer has he ever had the temerity or the balls to bash a Florida state judge, Florida Supreme Court justice when he argued in front of the Florida Supreme Court as a solicitor general in Florida or any of their staff. I assure you, he has never, until he got into bed with Donald Trump, ever did that. And yet he comes to my and your city and our bar and tries to crap all over the process because his client has his hands up his backside. Who's his local counsel? Who pro hoc vichyed him in? Because, you know, local Cliff counsel- Robert in Long Island. Because that's, that's, I mean, I try cases, I handle cases all over the country and all over the state. I did a, I did a trial in the far reaches of upper New York state. And I, I'm barred in New York. I can practice there. I hired local counsel because there is nothing like local counsel. They know every courtroom's different. Every judge is different. Every the every DA's office or is different. You know, just the way they do things. And there is nothing. This would not have happened. They would not have screwed up this appeal had they had someone who knew what they were doing and that who knew how to practice in New York. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. They're, they're like a, they're like a, um, keystone cops of lawyers and lawyering, you know, just in a, in a serious case like this, that they wouldn't have someone who practices right here in the first department. It's just, it's almost malpractice to me. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. She says she's a member of the New York state bar, Alina Hava. Well, my, the, the people on the street don't agree, but I, I'm not sure about that. And if she's, she doesn't practice regularly in New York, look, it's hard to practice in New York. It's hard. To, it's hard to pass the exam and it's hard to practice. We have a thing called the CPLR, which is all about our civil procedure. It's unlike any other state. Most states follow and model themselves after the federal rules of civil procedure. And it's sort of when you look at the local, if you look at the Florida rules, for instance, of civil procedure that Chris Keis is used to, and you look at them next to the federal, you know, you can see they're pretty close. New York, New York's got this Byzantine thing from the 1930s that we've been, you know, you and I still pull out the book. Oh, where is that in the CPLR, let alone the appellate rules? So anyway, we'll, we'll continue to follow, like you said, the Keystone Cops uh, and, and what, what uh, transpires in New York. We'll turn next in our podcast to Jack Smith getting ready for trial in March, has some filings to do and some evidence he needs to identify in advance, uh, special 404B evidence, which has a special quality. And Karen and I will break that all down along with some developments in the Rudy Giuliani trial, going to jury trial, just on damages, how big of a check that he's going to have to write to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss in the middle of December. Christmas comes early to Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman. And then finally, Nevada, Nevada, Nevada. It's all about elect fake electors who also were heads of the GOP in Nevada now being indicted in, based on their activities in the 2020 election. All that and so much more. But first... One of my favorite breaks of the show, our sponsors. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating clean. Let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean this holiday season with chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes featuring fresh ingredients with nothing artificial. Choose from recipes featuring lean proteins like turkey and sockeye salmon, barramundi, tilapia, scallops and shrimp, certified organic whole fruits, vegetables and eggs, and plenty of whole grain options. Eat clean the delicious way this December with flavor-packed recipes like buttery lemon garlic shrimp, harissa apricot chicken, maple butternut squash risotto, and sriracha tamari beef bowls. Feel your best with nutritionist-approved recipes, including calorie-smart meals under 650 calories, 
protein-packed meals with 30-plus grams of protein on average per serving, science-backed Mediterranean recipes, and flavorful, plant-rich vegan and vegetarian meals featuring certified organic whole fruits and vegetables, good-for-you grains, and plant-based proteins. Also, Green Chef offsets 100% of their delivery emissions, as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Plus, nearly all packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas in the U.S. Deliver everything you need to eat clean the easy way this December. Feel your best with chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes packed with clean ingredients that support your healthy lifestyle and taste great, too. I love Green Chef. My absolute favorite is the spicy chicken and broccoli stir fry. Delicious. Go to greenchef.com slash 60 legal AF and use code 60 legal AF to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60 legal AF and use code 60 legal AF to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Green Chef the number one meal kit for eating well. Do you remember your first holiday ever? Probably not, but I bet your parents do. And they have the pictures to prove it. Probably a lot of pictures to prove it. But even if they have one or two on the wall, there's a ton they haven't seen in years. You can put all those amazing childhood holiday photos in a place where your parents can actually see them. An Aura digital frame. Look, there's sort of a famous photo in my family. Every year at Thanksgiving, when I was three and four, we'd go to my grandparents' house on Long Island. It was near my birthday, my birthday a few days after Thanksgiving. And there's this amazing photo of me, my mom, a birthday cake, and a turkey on Thanksgiving. It was so great. People used it at my 40th birthday party. But look, I haven't seen it since. And what do you do with it? Think Aura Frames. Aura Frames was named the number one digital frame by Wirecutter, the strategist, and Wired. And it doesn't have to be just your pictures. In the app, you can add other members so your siblings and cousins and friends can all upload their own photos too. There's unlimited storage, so you don't even have to fight over it. Visit AuraFrames.com slash LegalAF today and get $30 off their best-selling frames. These frames sell out quickly, though, so get yours before they're gone. That's A-U-R-A, frames.com slash legal AF. Use promo code legal AF to get $30 off their best-selling frame. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> We're back. Aura Frames, Green Chef. Those are our sponsors for tonight. Great sponsors. I love those sponsors. I, I, eat, I eat those sponsors and use those sponsors. Same. My Let's parents talk. actually love the aura. We're going down to visit my mom this weekend and we're given, uh, she's in Atlanta in a, unfortunately in a um, assisted living facility. And we're bringing her an aura frame that we preloaded with all of our most recent photos. And now once we set it up in a room, we'll be able just to shoot off the app. You know, it's really seamless photos in real time that'll just revolve on her frame and uh, just- That's what we do, exactly. Yeah. I'm 3,000 miles away from my parents. And yeah. uh, what I do is I have access to their account and I just populate it with new photos yeah. whenever I feel like it. And I have my own Aura frame. I love the Aura. And then I do that while I'm eating sizzling chicken stir fry <laughs> from Green Chef. All right, let's talk about, um, speaking of sizzling, let's talk about Jack Smith. Um, Donald Trump's lawyers might not realize they're going to trial in March and are doing everything they can in the District of Columbia case to avoid it. Uh, they're waiting on a, we're waiting on a gag order to be reinstated, I would presume, by D.C. But in the meantime, there's a case to be tried. And as part of that case, there's a rule of evidence that Karen, trial lawyers like Karen and me, like to, to refer to as 404B, literally is a rule of the evidence code, which talks about a certain special quality of evidence that's being used not to show that somebody, because they did something bad in the past, they have a propensity to do something bad in the future, but it can be used to go to the heart of this case against Donald Trump, which is common plan, intent, criminal intent, lack of mistake, inadvertence, and all of that. So I know, Karen, you did a nice breakdown of it uh, with Donya Perry. 
uh, out recently, and it's up on it's up on our uh, one of our hot takes that's running right now. So why don't you uh, why don't you lead off on this one, and then I'll fill in the the couple that I found really interesting that I did some hot takes on. Yeah, sure. So uh, in the state, we called this Molino, M-O-L-I-N-E-A-U-X, the French spelling, but it's uh, Rule 404B federally, as you said. It's basically the same thing. And it's essentially you're not allowed to put in evidence of propensity of criminal activity. And it seems almost counterintuitive, right? Because if if you're a serial burglar and you go and you commit burglary after burglary after burglary, and then you're caught doing a burglary, it seems like it would be probative, you know, to show that um, that this is somebody who that's what they do. Right. And unfortunately, that is not allowed in because the prejudicial effect and that's the balancing test that the court will use is they weigh the probative value against the prejudicial effect. They'd say, look, just because he commits lots of burglaries doesn't mean he did this one. And you still have to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. But there is an exception to this kind of propensity um, propensity propensity argument, and it's to go to prove a, up a particular character trait or a particular um, a particular point, like, as you said, motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, absence of mistake, or lack of accident. And if you're going to introduce any of this 404B evidence. And 404B evidence is literally anything that's an uncharged bad act or uncharged crime. And in this particular indictment, the conspiracy is very short, right? The the Jack Smith DC case, it's from November of 2020 to January of 2021. So about two months. And in two of the charges, it's even shorter, actually. It's about a month, a month and a half. it's a very short, narrow conspiracy from, from November of 2020 to January of 2020, 21, one defendant, four charges. And Jack Smith did it very, um, very kind of tight for a reason. And it makes sense. So if he wants to bring up anything that is beyond that time period, either before November or after January, he, one could argue that that's an uncharged bad act or an uncharged crime. And what Jack Smith did was said, look, even though much of what we're about to ask you to allow us to admit falls at different times, it's in, intrinsically part of the crime. It's intrinsically part of the evidence. It's not extrinsic. And he said, but If you find that it is extrinsic to the crime, in the abundance of caution, we are going to serve notice of 404B evidence that we intend to offer in our direct case as part of our case that we're putting on. And that way we we, we, uh, comply with the notice requirement. It has to be in writing. And not only do we have to, not only does the law require you as a prosecutor to spell out what it is, what 404B evidence, what are the bad acts that you want to bring into your case, but you have to give the reason. You have to say, I want to bring this in because in all of the past burglaries, he always, uh, you know, he always left behind a, a pink scarf. And in this particular case, there was a pink scarf. And so that was his signature, right? That shows a common scheme or plan. It shows his identity. It shows his modus operandi. You know, that would be allowed in, you know, to show that, no, this is the guy. He's the guy who always leaves behind a pink scarf because he's done it 10 other times. And that's when you can bring it in because it's for that purpose. It's not to show that he has a propensity to commit a crime. And so, and so that's, that's how the judge looks at it. It's entirely in the judge's discretion to allow it in or not. And, uh, and it's not appealable the way, the way certain very limited things are appealable mid trial. It's appealable only after the fact, meaning if he's convicted, then he can appeal it in the normal course. He can't go up on appeal prior to trial or during trial, if he doesn't like Judge Chutkin's ruling, neither side can do that. And then that's called an interlocutory appeal, which they cannot take the way they can, the way Trump is doing in the presidential immunity and other constitutional arguments that he's making. Those, you know, last week, uh, Judge Chutkin immediately after the DC circuit in a civil case ruled that there is no presidential immunity in civil cases for former presidents uh, who were acting outside the scope of their job. Within hours of that ruling, Judge Chutkin said, and there's no presidential immunity in criminal cases. 
either. And her 48 page ruling on that is, is like a novel and worth reading for anybody who, who wants to learn about presidential immunity and the history of our country and Alexander Hamilton. It's actually a great decision and I, I loved reading it. Um, but in this particular, getting back to, back to Judge Chutkin and the 404B evidence, um, I would categorize Jack Smith's, uh, evidence in three categories that he wants to bring in. And one is historical evidence of his consistent plan of claiming election fraud that was baseless. And, and that's sort of category number one. And, and there, Jack Smith talk goes as far back as November of 2012, where Donald Trump issued a tweet uh, saying that voting machines had switched votes from Mitt Romney to Barack Obama. Does that sound familiar? Um, and uh, that was, you know, obviously a long time ago before 2020. And um, and he was already talking about this voting machine switch without any basis. And then in 2016, he complained again without any basis of widespread voter fraud and basically going on and on about that again, baseless. Um, but Jack Smith wants to bring that in as evidence to show a common scheme of plan or plan of falsely blaming people for fraud in election results. And it also shows his motive and his intention to and his plan to obstruct the certification of the 2020 election. Um, he also in that same category um, talked about brought out some of his own words, Trump's own words, where he refused, for example, prior to the 2020 election, he refused to commit to a peaceful transition if he lost, and that win, lose, or draw with rioting and everything else, he still wouldn't, he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't commit to a peaceful transfer of power. And, and, you know, that I thought that was incredibly, that will be incredibly power, powerful if it comes in. Um, the next category, um, that I would say that he wanted to, that Jack Smith wants to bring in, uh, had to do with Jack, um, Trump's knowledge that he lost the election and his motive and his intention to try and steal the election. And in that, he brings up several examples, the fake electors, for example, you know, that's a, a huge, that's a huge, um, although that is definitely part of this, he's talking, Jack, and so he's will be allowed to bring that in. I think that um, what Jack Smith wanted to talk about is things that he didn't mention in the indictment, right? He, he talked about out, um, stuff that happened, for example, text, it looks like he got new text messages because uh, he revealed, I think for the first time, I don't remember seeing this, it looks like yet a seventh now unindicted co-conspirator that seems to be cooperating because it's redacted in there, this um, election employee in Detroit uh, that I had not heard of before, didn't know about. So he seems to have obtained a cooperator since the last uh, the last indictment and potentially got a new, got this new evidence. And so that's why it's not in the indictment and why I think he added it here in 404B evidence. Um, as well as, you know, all of the time he and Giuliani, for example, um, were talking about retaliating against and retribution against, you know, um, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, that, that brings us to, to the next, um, basically the next category, which is where he attacks individuals, right? He attacks Pence, he attacks Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. And, and what Jack Smith wants to bring out is the stuff that has happened that continues to happen, right? And he wants to talk about, for example, you know, the Proud Boys in, in 2020 when he said, you know, stand back and stand by. That was his way of knowing. And then seeing what happened January 6th, they, they want to bring out that he knows that the people, his followers commit violence. And so when they put on Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, who will testify and talk about the threats and harassment that they have suffered because Donald Trump singles them out, Jack Smith is going to use all of these other examples to show he knows what he's doing. He knows what his followers are doing. And even after the select committee hearings, I thought this was really powerful. Even after the select com committee hearings um, that happened two years after uh, Jan 6, where there were videotapes of Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman talking about the horrific vitriolic death threats and racist things that they encountered. Tr Donald Trump at that point, knew because he 
obviously knew because that was publicized and that was broadcast. He knew about that. And even after hearing about that, he doubled down with his, with his, um, with his, you know, comments about them and recommended a- attacks on them in posts in his Truth Social, and he even zeroed in on one of them, writing that she's an election fraudster, a liar, and one of the treacherous monsters who stole the country, and that she would be in legal trouble. I mean, you know, it's just outrageous. And uh, Jack Smith said, "Look, this shows his plan to silence his people and to s- silence those who come out against them. It's, it sh- goes to his knowledge that the public attacks on people like Shea Moss, Ruby Friedman, Mike Pence, etc., could foreseeably lead to violence and to threats and harassment. And you know, I, I thought it was a really, really com- um, compelling motion that I think um, that I think that." he will win most of these, if not all of them. Donya Perry, who was on with me, thinks that the judge may, some some of the Shea Moss, Ruby Freeman stuff, she thinks that the judge um, may limit because it is so prejudicial and so compelling and so powerful. Um, but but I think it all comes in. What about you, Popak? What did you think? Yeah, two that I liked the most out of all the six or seven, um, I don't. I don't think I disagree with Danya. I think there'll be some some limiting of some of these things. The reason that we're talking about it, just for our audience, is that you have to give notice of your intention to use this type of powerful, potentially prejudicial, having to be balanced type evidence, especially when you're putting on evidence not of the actual conduct that's been charged in the indictment, because that's not four hundred four B. Let me just wait for this. Let me just wait for this to pass. Okay. Um, It's not, that's not 404B. Actual evidence of the crimes charged, the four conspiracy counts against Donald Trump, that's just stuff that he did that supports, that comes out of the indictment and there are elements of the crime and conduct consistent with the crime. This, as you said earlier, is a trying to bring over the wall into the courtroom evidence of prior conduct, historical uh, historical conduct, evidence, testimony, statements, videos, and the like to try to aim at an element of the crime that has been charged. And that's what we're doing here. And that's why we're talking about it because you have to, you can't sandbag the other side. You can't surprise them or the court and try to just, some people might be thinking like, well, why don't they just do it in March? You got to do all this stuff in advance. First of all, there's a pretrial order that's that schedules out when filings like this are due. And believe me, if we can, if 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 Jack Smith didn't have to give Donald Trump's lawyers notice of this, he would not, and he would save it, uh, save it for trial as a surprise. But the 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 rules allow for the litigation of the issue and the resolution of the issue well before trial, so that the jury's minds aren't blown with some of this information. The two that I I took away that I I found really interesting because it's, again, an example of the more evidence that we're learning. We're not even at the tip of the iceberg of what was listed in the indictment. Um, Donald Trump is shadow boxing because all he knows is what's been dumped on him, which is the, of course, the one terabyte of information, the two tractor trailers worth of information, but doesn't know which of those are going to be used against them particularly yet. And he's got to he's got to try to figure out what the case is against him. Of course, prosecutors have informational advantage because they know exactly the testimony and the clips and the evidence and exhibits that they're going to use against Donald Trump. So you always have that kind of informational asymmetry between the two sides, the government and the de- on the defense side. And here you we but we're learning when there when there's a mandatory filing in the court process like we just had, that's when we start learning, you know, the, the kind of the, uh, the uh, curtain gets cold, pulled back, you know, the, the hood gets opened and we get to see under the hood as to some more evidence and, uh, that, uh, and how the prosecutors see the case. You know, it's like going shopping in a supermarket. No two baskets are the same when you're waiting in line in a supermarket and you look over at your neighbor's basket, I assure you, it is not identical to yours. Uh, and so you can put this, the building blocks of this case together in different ways. What turns one prosecutor on might turn off another. I mean, there's some fundamental things, maybe 80% 
if Karen got her hands as a prosecutor, former prosecutor, on the file, so to speak, about 80 or 90 percent of it might be exactly the same as Jack's. But there's always that difference, right, of, of prosecutorial discretion and things that they light on and they think from their past experience will be successful in front of a jury in a case like this one. And so that's what they're trying to build right now. And what we learned, for instance, was, um, and I outed him already because it's obvious who it is, there's an unindicted co-conspirator that's listed as one of the 404B potential pieces of evidence against Donald Trump who uh, interfered in the Detroit uh, vote counting and suggested or argued that there should be a riot of Trump supporters and others clashing in front of the streets in front of the count when he learned that um, that Trump was going to lose. As soon as they learned that Biden was winning election night, two things happened in Detroit. One is the actual counting office got flooded with people that were supposed to be poll watchers who are instead just doing all sorts of ridiculous challenges to try to gum up the works and throw sand in the works of the legitimate vote counting that was going on. And in the streets outside of the vote counting center in Detroit, there were, I wouldn't call them a mob. We have a video clip we may be able to run tonight, but there was, you know, like a, a group of people. Uh, and there were a group of people on the other side. And what Boris Epstein, and that's who I'm outing right here on my hot take, who was a political consultant and a lawyer for Donald Trump still to this day, involved with every decision making that Donald Trump does in civil or criminal cases, went so far as to hire for Donald Trump the current lawyers that he has, Chris Keis and Todd Blanche. Um, that Boris Epstein, who's identified in the 404B as an employee of the campaign, a campaign employee. He's listed in the indictment as unindicted co-conspirator number six, a political consultant. There's only one political consultant slash campaign employee who is an unindicted co-conspirator, and that's Boris Epstein. Can't be the lawyers, even though he is a lawyer, he doesn't really operate as one. But it's not it's not Ken Chesbro, Sidney Powell, John Eastman, Jeff Clark, or Rudy Giuliani. It's Boris Epstein. And so Boris Epstein, on behalf of President Trump at the time, then President Trump, tried to cause a riot in Detroit to stop the count. I said in one of my hot takes, people might be people who tune in late might think I'm reciting last season of succession. Spoiler alert, I'm not. This is what they tried to do. And Jack Smith wants to present that to the jury along with evidence that they they purposefully flooded with a goon squad into the vote counting to try to stop the vote count. Just as Boris Epstein is, Epstein is alleged to have done in the indictment on Jan 6th, where he, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump, to try to stop the vote count related to the electoral certification, tried to do a pressure campaign using the violence of Jan 6th, i.e. that riot, to stop the vote count. Never heard that before. Begs the question, why isn't Boris Epstein in chains and shackled? And why isn't he in an orange jumpsuit? And why hasn't he been indicted? That's for another day and another hot take. I have a theory about that. It has to do with keeping the March trial date at all costs. So that I thought was fascinating. And, and I thought of it as a trial lawyer, the power of the power of that being presented to a jury at the right moment in time in a trial. It would be just be breathtaking. It would just change the weather in the room for that particular for that particular day, day whatever of the trial against Donald Trump, putting aside all the lawyers and all the vice presidents that are going to come and testify against Donald Trump. That kind of he tried to start a riot as soon as they realized that they were losing, which goes to the intent of Donald Trump, the criminal intent that he knew he had lost on election night, was trying to do everything he could to avoid the peaceful transfer of power even then. Now it's one. The second one is, as you mentioned, not only is Donald Trump been complaining about voter fraud since like 2012, arguing that there was vote flipping somehow, software, hardware for Mitt Romney votes that went to Barack Obama. But on more than one occasion, he's refused to acknowledge that, the, that he would agree to a peaceful transfer of power. And there's two clips in particular, and I did it on a hot take that's coming up soon, that they mentioned by name in which during the debate with Hillary Clinton, he was asked by the debate moderator in 2016, Chris Wallace, will you right here in front of the American people, will you commit to a peaceful transfer of power the way we've done in every year of our republic going forward? Eh, we'll see. Sir, I'm sorry. We'll see is not an answer. What do you mean we'll see? Well, the ballots. 
the ballots, got to count the ballots, don't know about the ballots, too early, can't commit. And to which Hillary Clinton responded, that is a, uh, I'm trying to think of her word off the top of my head. We have a clip of it. She says something along the lines that that is an abomination. That is, har- that's the word. That this That is horrifying. What my opponent for the presidency just said about is not supporting the peaceful transfer of power. And then there's a clip from uh, September of 2020, two months before the election, with the kind of the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter protests and other issues uh, in our in some of our big cities that summer, uh, fresh on everybody's mind. A reporter asked Donald Trump at a press conference where all he wanted to probably talk about was Amy Coney Barrett being picked the next day in the Rose Garden for Supreme Court justice. He got asked with riots in red and blue states and blood in the streets. Will you commit here right now, Mr. President, to a peaceful transfer of power? And instead of saying yes to kind of quell uh, people's emotions about it, he threw gasoline on it and said the opposite. He said, the ballots, you got to get those ballots thrown out. And if you get the ballots thrown out, there won't be a, a transition. There'll be a continuation. Right. He'll stay in office. Now, that's easy to unpack. He didn't like, and his side didn't like, the mail-in and absentee ballots that were being used in all states, including in blue states, because of COVID and people probably not wanting to wait in line shoulder to shoulder with their neighbor during a pandemic. Yet finding a way using absentee and mail-in ballots, which are as secure as any other way of voting, Donald Trump only voted by absentee ballot for many of the years that he voted, if if he voted at all, that that was the way to balance the health risks in the pandemic with the constitutional right, fundamental right to vote. But for Donald Trump, the ballots, too many mail-in ballots because he wants to suppress the vote because he wants to disenfranchise. Because if you suppress the vote and disenfranchise in September, you don't have to worry about a vote count on the other end that's against you in November. So there was a lot packed into that statement. And for Jack Smith, he wants to put that in front of the jury and show C, This is the common purpose and plan. This is the intent. Cling to power, never transition. Always claim the ballots are wrong. Always claim there's fraud in the election and try to stay in office. That goes to criminal mind and criminal intent for Donald Trump. And he'll play, if he he wins on that issue in front of Judge Chutkin, he'll play those clips for the jury as part of that overall presentation. So for me, you did the good category thing, and I kind of drilled down on, on two in particular. Uh, before we move on in the pod, anything else on the 404B? Which, But just to leave it at this, the notice comes in, Trump has another opportunity to argue against it. Maybe I think there's a reply brief notice thing. And then Judge Chutkin's, Chutkin's going to go thumb up, thumb down on these categories of information and evidence outside of the actual elements of what's been charged in the indictment. Yeah, the only other thing is uh, that struck me was, you know, Donald Trump is arguing that he wants to strike the language of Jan 6 and the attack from the indictment, if you recall. He doesn't yeah. like that in there. And Je- and Jack Smith kind of was like, well, not only are we not, are we objecting to that? I want to show that you actually had a motive and intent for that exact same thing to happen on January 6th by introducing evidence of how you characterize the rioters and the insurrectionists, how you have openly and proudly supported them, all of these individuals who criminally participated in the obstructing of a congressional certification that day, including suggesting that he's going to pardon them if reelected, and that he has conceded that he had the ability to influence their actions even during the attack, right? As he said to Kate, um, uh, to Caitlin Collins on CNN in that town hall, you might, you know, when he said, my listeners, my followers listen to me like nobody else. Um, And even talked about certain individuals, he even has talked about specific individuals he wants to pardon, who, and he caught, who are, uh, who committed seditious conspiracy and violent assaults on the cops, like Enrique Tario, right? He said, I want to tell you, he and other people have been treated horribly and called them hostages, political hostages. I'm sorry that he's not a political hostage. He's in prison. And, you know, just the way he plays that Jan 6 prison national anthem at his rallies and and calls them all hostages and supports them all. 
that was, I think that's going to be very powerful evidence um, that Jack Smith is going to introduce. Yeah, I think, I, as I said, either last week or on a hot take, there's just an entire team working for Jack Smith that's just scrubbing and scraping all of Donald Trump's social media, his statements, his rallies, his interviews, his his um, uh, debate performances for uh, uh, testimony, for uh, adverse testimony that they can use against him. We've said it from the very beginning. Donald Trump thinks he's winning uh, because he's out there raising money on the backs of lies and thinks he get, he wins the news cycle, so he's going to win the trial, and it's the exact opposite. It just provides more fodder for a very skilled prosecutor and a trial team to find the things that are, they'll hang him with his own words, and that's what we're watching now. Um, Rudy Giuliani going to trial, but not in the case that people would want at this moment, in the District of Columbia, presided over by Judge Beryl Howell, formerly the chief judge who was responsible for administrating all of the Jan 6 trials. There's been over 900 uh, either plea, uh, either convictions by plea or by bench trial or jury trial in the District of Columbia. And she was responsible for administrating a lot of those when she was the chief judge. Now, as just a federal, as a regular federal judge, she's got cases in front of her like the defamation case brought by Sh uh, uh, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, mother-daughter team in Georgia, Fulton County, speaking of election vote counting. And there is a trial coming up in December. And then finally, we have new reporting today, new information today, a couple of things. You got Nevada. Nevada uh, having indicted, likely on the backs of some testimony of a former Trump attorney, uh, a bunch of fake electors, all the fake electors in Nevada, including those in leadership uh, with the uh, GOP in Nevada. And we got oral argument in Colorado about the 14th Amendment and whether it, uh, Section 3, and whether it bans Donald Trump from being on the uh, on the ballot in at any time, primary or in the general election because he engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution. We'll cover all of that, but my second most favorite point in the podcast, we have a break from our sponsors. If you're a longtime listener, you might know I've been drinking AG1 for about three years now. I absolutely love AG1, and when I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health, and I also had more energy than ever. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes for gut support to balance my body's stress levels, as well as vitamin C and zinc to help support my immune system. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily, and that's why they've been a partner for so long. I truly have AG1 to thank for my foundational nutrition and perfect kickstart to the day. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash legal AF. That's drinkag1.com slash legal AF. Check it out. So drink AG1 in the morning. Eat Green Chef in the evening and then work on your aura frames. That's what we have going for us today on Legal AF. But Rudy Giuliani is not going to be doing any of that. Um, he's not going to have any money to do any of that because he's going to lose a lot in this defamation case that's going to trial in December. Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss settled out with some other right wing media people like OAN and others, leaving Rudy Giuliani who defamed and doxed them mercilessly, as, as did Donald Trump, uh, claiming that they committed voter fraud. They, uh, the, the, running, the running thematic there for the Trump organization and the campaign and their lawyers like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani was that in Fulton County, which is 80% Democrat, <laughs> that they, that's the place where you commit fraud, where it's 80% Democrat, right? Um, uh, and then the vote counting in Atlanta, when Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss with a low paid or no paid job of counting votes, doing their job, 
counting ballots, putting them into optical readers, taking discarded ballots, putting them into locked boxes under their desk and doing it all over again, rinse and repeat. No, to, to Donald Trump, who mentioned it during his perfect phone call to Brad Raffensperger and to Rudy Giuliani on his podcast, on Fox News and anywhere else, anyone else who would listen, this was part of a voter fraud because they were they were taking um, fake ballot ballots for Biden, Biden ballots, and stuffing the ballot box electronically or otherwise with votes that got dropped off in suitcases and briefcases that were from China, that um, whatever else were made up stuff that on, on a thumb drive, on a thumb drive that Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss were passing back and forth to each other and taking votes from under the table and putting them into the machine, which is true if you run the video backwards, which is what they did because the, actually the ballots were going from the table to the box, not the other way around. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation did a full investigation of this, as did the Secretary of State's investigative body, investigative branch, and completely cleared Ruby Freeman and Shane Moss of any voter fraud whatsoever. The thumb drive was a breath mint that was being passed uh, be between the two of them, and there was nothing untoward uh, or improper or fraudulent done by them at all. They're heroes, they're patriots doing their civic duty, and we know it because it was all caught on film, because there's cameras. And unlike Donald Trump, who tried to drown, bury, burn his video cameras at Mar-a-Lago to hide his misdeeds, these video video clips actually exist and were reviewed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. That didn't stop Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump, despite that, from continuing to claim that they committed voter fraud. It got so bad that they actually, two, at least three of the co-conspirators in Georgia, went after Ruby Freeman, inclu in including... Uh, a woman named Kuti, Kuti, who used to be a stylist for Kanye West and Black Voices for Trump leader, um, Willie Floyd, and Ray Smith, a, uh, a reverend who cornered Ruby Freeman, even bringing her to a police station to try to coerce her to, to, to uh, admit to, fraudulently admit to voter fraud. And that's part of the conspiracy of which Donald Trump is also tagged in Georgia with Ruby Freeman at the center. But Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss have a civil day in court to because they were doxxed, because they were almost uh, attacked physically. They had to move from their house for protection. And so they sued Rudy Giuliani. And Rudy Giuliani did so many things wrong. And it, it, you'd, you'd almost have to think that Rudy never was a member of the bar, that he was if like it would make a lot more sense if this was like my cousin Vinny instead of my cousin Rudy, where he didn't know the rules and the procedures. He'd never been in federal court before. I've never been in the big city before. I don't know how these things work. But That's he has a, a but he has a lawyer. Well, even if he didn't have a lawyer, Rudy Giuliani is was a lawyer for 40 years in the federal court practice. So how you are uh, so terrible at, at, at being a participant in the process that you completely flout the uh, the authority of the judge. You refuse to provide any of the documents that you're required to provide. You refuse to participate in discovery process. You get sanctioned three times for attorney's fees for over half a million dollars. And then when the judge has had enough, enough, Rudy, you lose your ability to defend the case and you get a judgment against you on liability. But how does, but how does his lawyer allow it to get to that point? If this was your client- You have more than one lawyer. <laughs> He's got an out of control client that's not, I mean, unless you bail out, which, you know, some, some tried to, you know, you, if you, you, you know, your client is his own worst enemy, there's not much you can do other than to say, it wasn't me, judge, don't sanction me, sanction him. Um, and but that's Rudy not what happened today no. when he was supposed to show up in court today and he didn't show up and the judge was like, what the heck you were supposed to be here. And the lawyer was like, oh, that was me. That wasn't him. Well, that one, that one, he took the bullet. But but where we the, how we got where we are, where lawyers are getting screamed at by the federal judge. This federal judge has been more than patient. She has re, she has been her orders have been violated half a dozen times by Rudy Giuliani, important ones. And it's gotten so bad that even when she gave him the last chance to turn over his financial records about his revenue from his podcast, how much money he makes, so that the jury has an idea for punitive damages, how much to award, if they're going to award any at all. He missed the deadline to do that. And the judge says, if you don't give this information within a week's time, I am going to give an instruction 
an adverse inference instruction to the future jury that tells them that as a matter of law, they are instructed to conclude that Rudy Giuliani is trying to hide his money to suppress his net worth, sound familiar, except it goes the other way for Trump, in order to avoid punitive damages and for good measure that he's not allowed to talk at all about anything related to the liability case. He just has to stand there and take it for damages only. Now, Rudy, hearing all of that, decided, well, my best place to avoid a huge jury, a, a huge award is with, is not, is with a uh, jury, is with a, sorry, is with a judge. So he argued at the last minute, there's no jury involved here, even though the judge has already decided that there's going to be a jury and that there's no jury. We're only down to damages. That's a judge thing, not a jury thing. And the judge says, well, you know, you may be right in circ certain circumstances, but I'm the trier of fact and I want help and I want a jury to handle the fact finding related to the damage amount. And so we're having a jury trial. See you guys on whatever day this was, yesterday or today in my courtroom. And she has ordered him to be there for every event in the case since. And he didn't show up today. And what happened with the judge, um, KFA? The judge got very upset, you know, and basically, you know, it was head scratcher how Giuliani did not show up for this and how he didn't... Um, how he didn't, you know, he, he wasn't here to agree to the things that he's supposed to agree on because the trial's starting next week. And, you know, look, a lot, it, this is fascinating to me because, you know, the, the amount of incompetence that is going on in addition to trying to, I, I actually, I don't even know what the strategy is. I, I, I can't wrap my head around this because, and maybe it's because Rudy Giuliani w was such a big, figure, a larger than life figure in New York for years and years and years. I just can't believe that he's gone from being, you know, a, a kind of a, he was America's mayor after 9-11, right? In addition to being a United States attorney for the Southern District of New York, you know, some would say the most prestigious um, U.S. attorney's office in the country. He's gone from, from that to the, you know, to having the a press conference outside of the Four Seasons, you know, whatever that place was, like a landscaping and gravel. landscaping, yeah. I mean, instead of the Four Seasons, with you know another one where he has that 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 hair dye, you know, dripping down his face, and now he's in this case. He's just this can't be a strategy, right? He's just screwing up at every single turn. He's not doing anything he's supposed to be doing. And now, it, so the latest one was, you know, he asked that there not be a jury, right? He said, I want just a bench trial, not a jury trial, because otherwise, you know, the the jury instruction that you're going to read is going to be, say, it's going to say that, you know, this was, you're only going to, the jury's only to consider damages because he's already been sanctioned. He's already been found a default judgment as a sanction, not even a default judgment the way the way, you know, there's no, there's no sort of like the way Judge Angoran did in the Trump case saying, you know, I, I've looked at all the papers and, and I think, you know, the plaintiff wins on the papers, basically the papers and all the, all the, the record before me. This isn't a substantive win. This is a win because of all of the things you just said that he has not done. And, you know, it's this willful, willful discovery misconduct. And, you know, he said basically that that it, what that would prejudice me um, in front of a jury. So I just wanted a judge trial. And the judge basically said, first of all, the Seventh Amendment guarantees the right to a jury trial in a civil case. And why should the plaintiff lose that right under these circumstances? That would be extremely unfair. And P.S., Rudy Giuliani, when we went over the jury charges, you didn't even object to that one. So now you're objecting like at the, you know, the 11th hour. It's like, it just seems like his lawyer isn't paying attention and he is just not getting involved at all in this case. But, but to what end? I mean, I, I just don't understand because he's going to for sure be found 100% liable and the damages are going to be, you know, the, the two most compelling witnesses in, in the Jack Smith cases are going to be Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, right? They, they are, when they testify about what has happened to them, you know, there's not going to be a dry eye in the house and the same thing is going to go for the Giuliani trial, right? And, and all of the things that, that Giuliani said and, and did about him. And, you know, 
I loved the one thing I did love um, that I, I wrote down that uh, that Beryl Howell wrote. He said, you know, the irony of this assertion must be highlighted given the many opportunities Giuliani was afforded to comply with his discovery obligations, but to no avail. And the further opportunities Giuliani was afforded to be heard on any adverse instructions to be given to the jury, but he consented to those instructions. And Giuliani's own discovery misconduct necessitated the entry of default judgment against him. And this court will not reward him for conduct that has already resulted in significant prejudice to the plaintiffs. I mean, you know, I, it's like, a, I just love the way he, he phrased that. And look, you know, he only has himself to blame. And, you know, and then he doesn't show up today. I mean, I, I just, the whole thing makes no sense to me, um, how this is going to go down and how, why this is happening. And, you know, the other question we were talking about, you know, I have a few questions about the trial for you, the civil lawyer, because I love learning from you. Um, is first of all, it's going to be a jury of eight people. Why eight, not 12, right? How, how do you get the number of, of jurors um, in a civil case? And does it have to be unanimous? And I'd love to hear, because I love learning from you in, in these circumstances. I think you're okay, on so we're, doing, we're So we're doing jury. All right. So you need between six and 12, and usually the parties, whatever the standard practice is for that courtroom. I, I've never done eight. I've done six. I've done nine and I've done 12. Eight's an odd number, not literally. Um, <laughs> it's an even number that happens to be odd. Generally, it comes from court practice or consultation with the lawyers that are involved about how many that they want. It has to be over six. Usually it's under 12. Um, eight's a weird number. Of you read eight? Because yeah. eight, um, eight, yeah, okay. So, all right, so it's eight. And in so terms it's not of, statutory, it's like agreed upon? Well, it's statutory between the numbers of 6 and 12, and then you can sort of pick what you want in between there and satisfy the, the requirements. As to, for criminal, it's generally unanimous. For, for a federal civil, uh, the last time I did a federal civil, I needed... Um, I don't think it's a majority. I think you have to get, let, let, when we go to the next, when you're chatting through the next one, I'll double check about the, the issue of a unanimity for it. Because um, I might be confusing it with the state requirement. Well, but that that's why legal AF is great. I'll figure it out <laughs> and I will report it. So uh, that's we'll follow that trial closely. It's going to be tens of millions of dollars awarded and punitive damages by this jury against Rudy Giuliani. And, as you and I joked before the show, um, you know, I think uh, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss would like living on the Upper East Side of New York in, an, in a condo that uh, Rudy used to own uh, or in Florida in near Mar-a-Lago. I think those are both beautiful places for that. that one, question, to live. one question you and I talked about beforehand, and I'd love to hear your thoughts because I don't understand it, is why <laughs> they didn't sue Donald Trump. Why did they just sue Giuliani. I even asked ahead of time. I was like, did I miss yeah. it? Was did I forget what happened to it? Because logically, to not sue when you again, when you read what happened to them and who did it, it was very much Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani. It wasn't just Rudy Giuliani. So why they didn't sue Trump, I don't, I don't get it. I think these lawyers made Trump's a got money. I think these lawyers made a tactical decision that they did not want to go through. Look, we're three years into an immunity decision, two and a half years into an immunity decision in D.C. Uh, Court of Appeals about whether Donald Trump can, can have civil liability to the outer boundaries of his office um, in under the KKK Act for the injuries to the Capitol Police, Metro Police, and to the elected officials that were, you know, running for their lives during Jan 6th. And the answer just got answered last week. Um, that issue um, got raised in the E. Jean Carroll case uh, as well. Even, and that just got decided or sort of decided, um, half decided recently. And so I think this is not having spoken to these lawyers, but these lawyers looking around, having sued the media company and gotten a quick settlement and having sued Rudy, coming right off of you know that issue of whether Donald Trump's statements are inside his scope or color of his authority or he's campaigner in chief and he's outside. 
they just, you know, they're doing this kind of pro, pro se, pro, they're doing this pro bono, maybe a contingency, certainly a contingency fee. And, you know, you have to pick your, you have to pick your battles. And the battle that they didn't want is to fight through Donald Trump and all the immunity issues and Donald Trump's bullshit making a circus as we've seen in, I mean, what bigger circ, he didn't even go to E. Jean Carroll and it was a circus. He went to the civil fraud case and it was like the circus like I've never seen as a child. And so, you know what, you know what they've avoided in DC? They've avoided the circus and they got Rudy off by himself for him to crap his own diaper, which is all he's done since he's been a defendant in the case and gotten, and he's already lost the case and they haven't had to go through the, the, the Trump bullshit. I think if that is the reason, A, they didn't forget. It's not because they forgot. They didn't go, hmm, who are we missing here? Somebody made a decision in consultation with the client that they didn't want to pick the fight with Donald Trump and have to be the be the firm to have to prove whether he has immunity or not for that particular set of actions when there are all these other low hanging fruit they could go after. That's the only explanation because it's I the, the lawyers are very very good and the firms are very well, very hope, good. I they hope that's forget. the explanation. Yeah, no, I hope that's the explanation. Well, I what, hope else it's not. what else could be? What else? The other be? thing it could be, to be honest, is you know now that I represent clients and I know what goes into the thinking of certain clients, I wonder whether they were afraid because when you when you go after Donald Trump, he look what he's done. Look at how he doubles down. Look at why there's an E. Jean Carroll too. I mean, look at what he does to people. He's a the bully in chief and and he got they got death threats. I mean, those were real. And I just hope he didn't silence them and make it so that they were af actually too afraid to bring the case against him. That, that cool. would be a shame. Yeah, I don't th knowing that, that Wilkie Farr and Gallagher, which is a major firm out of New York, it is not going to be afraid of Donald Trump. Now, maybe they're no, firm. not the lawyers, not the lawyers. Maybe. I'm talking about the the plaintiffs. Oh, oh, you're, you're talking about Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss. Yes, yes, I'm talking. I'm not talking about the lawyers. Of course, the lawyers aren't afraid. I'm maybe. saying. Maybe. I wonder if the plaintiffs were like, I can't like go that. through that again. I can't go through that again. Well, the point you're making is a good one, which is this is a client decision ultimately. So whether the yeah. law firm decided, look, the path of least resistance for us to get you the money and connect you to money is to go after people not named Donald Trump. But it also could have been, I don't want to sue Donald Trump. I already almost lost my house. I had to have law enforcement sitting outside my house and I don't need Trump world. Although, you know, Rudy is a part of Trump world, but not directly taking on the cult leader. I like that. I think that's a very good potential analysis. One day, maybe we'll have the lawyers for Wilkie Farr on the show and we can ask them. Let's turn our attention on that one. Let's turn our attention now to breaking news today in Nevada. Um, a lot of states, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, the battleground states are looking, not Florida, because of its governor, are looking at the fake electors and whether they were criminally liable for impersonating real electors and other things that are on the statute books for individual states. Because if they thought they were going to get away with it, just participate in the conspiracy uh, that's been, that it's at the heart of at least two criminal indictments, one in Georgia and one in the District of Columbia, they got another thing coming. And so it, it, it took a long time. I think many of these attorney generals that are now handling these cases that are going after them waited to see what Jack Smith would do, what the Jan 6 committee would do, what Fawny Willis would do. And then when the dust settled, they're finally getting around in 2023, late in 2023, to get their indictments. Now, the advantage to waiting is a lot of the work has been done for them. A lot of the heavy lifting has been done by, done for them by Fawny Willis and Jack Smith in their indictments and in the witnesses that, that have been disclosed. For instance, one of the reasons I'm sure that that Nevada grand jury indicted all of these members of the uh, GOP in Nevada for being fake electors is because Ken Chesbro, the now felon former Trump lawyer uh, architect uh, with John Eastman of the fake elector scheme, uh, got permission 10 days ago to go to Georgia, uh, sorry, to go from Georgia, leave Georgia and the conditions of his release and go to states like Arizona and Nevada to cooperate and, and DC. They were listed by name. And then, whoo, lo and behold, there's a grand jury in Nevada right after Ken Jesbro visits that indicts those, uh, those GOP members. Tell us what you know about the indictments there, and then we can touch on Colorado at the end, you know, as we end the podcast. 
Yeah, well, big news coming out of Nevada, right? The Attorney General Aaron Ford announced that six Nevadans, I know you say Nevada, um, I'm from California, and in California we say Nevada, um, or at least I grew up saying Nevada, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who are cringing right now, um, but that, that's how I learned it. Anyway, that they uh, falsely represented themselves as state electors in 2020. And, um, you know, look, if you just to remind everyone, there was uh, Republicans in seven different states, right? Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, who hatched the fake elector scheme and pretended to be the duly elected and qualified electors, right? And then these documents were sent to the United States Senate, as well as the archivist. And they, it was done as if they were the legitimate electors. And Michigan and Georgia have already filed criminal charges because of this scheme. Fonnie Willis in Georgia did the big sweeping RICO case that in addition to charging some electors, charged the lawyers, charged Trump and others in the scheme. There were 19 total. And in Michigan, the attorney general there only indicted the fake electors. They didn't go up the food chain, if you will. And Nevada seems to have uh, gone, has se seems to have um, followed Michigan's lead and indicted six Republican uh, fake electors, including the chairman of the RNC in uh, that state. And, you know, it's it, each person was charged with two felony charges. I think they carry a max of five, one is five years, the other is four years. Uh, the charges are offering a false instrument for filing and uttering a forged instrument by submitting fraudulent documents to state and, and federal officials. So that's when they submitted the fake electors, the slates to the archives and to the Senate. And, you know, the attorney general opened this investigation a mere few weeks ago, despite previously saying they were unlikely to do so because of the fact that Chesbro is cooperating and has made the difference. So this is, you know, this is huge that some that they're going to be held accountable and, you know, that 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 is um that that's happening now, you know, in when this came down and in preparation um, for the podcast, I, I went back to the Jack Smith indictment just to just remind myself what the allegations are in Nevada. And, you know, Jack Smith goes state by state. There's a whole section on the states and the fake electors and he goes in alphabetical order, you know, Arizona and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, you know, whatever. It's in alphabetical order, but there's no Nevada in there, which I thought was very strange because why isn't there a separate section for, for Nevada? Nevada, but it is mentioned in the indictment. It's just not a separate section. Anyway, so I, it's just it's just interesting to me that the conduct there uh, perhaps is not quite as egregious as in other states, or maybe that Trump wasn't as involved there as he was in the other states. Who knows? But there's clearly a case. It was clearly part of the part of the common, you know, part of the, the scheme, the plan, you know, given the fact that Chesbro was able to provide this information and this testimony that was the key to being able to indict this case. So, um, so I think, you know, there's other investigations in other states going on as well. I think Arizona has an open investigation um, and there's rumblings that same with other states. So, Finally, people are starting to be held accountable for this scheme. And, you know, just again, to remind everybody, um, the defense here is going to be we're allowed, we were allowed to do this. In fact, there's precedent for it uh, in the 60s in the, in, in the Kennedy um, election in Hawaii, it was so close that they did, a, Kennedy's people put together an all, uh, an, a just in case slate of electors, if you will, in case it turns out when they actually recount the votes, he wins. They didn't submit them as the actual electors though. They just had them there just in case he won. And in fact, he did win. And so they ended up using those electors. So they actually turned out to be the real electors. So it's just a matter, but so that that doesn't mean you can lie and put in a fake slate of electors because these weren't just in case electors. These were actually being held out as the legitimate electors in an effort to try to steal the election from Biden. Yeah, Nixon, Nixon and Hawaii and Kennedy are, are op apples and oranges that they first called the state for Nixon and there were electors that stepped up. They then recounted and called the state properly for Kennedy 
which help put them over the top. And then those electors, that's different than certifying that your electors are the real electors, sending them to the, sending them to the National Archive, the the judge of your state and to Mike Pence to try to get them to be recognized as the real electors. That didn't happen. They love they love that Nixon versus Kennedy case, except they totally distort it and misstate it, which is easily pointed out. And we're going to watch. Uh, we're probably not going to cover it too much in detail today because we're just we want to really read through it. But uh, Colorado is holding oral argument at the Supreme Court level in Colorado about whether um, the Fourteenth Amendment, Section Three, applies to Donald Trump as president. Really, the sole issue for them on on appeal. Because the only issue that the trial judge we think got wrong is that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, doesn't apply to a former president. Um, she, everything else she found, the engagement in insurrection and rebellion against the Constitution, she found all that as a matter of fact in her fact finding, but then sort of fumbled, we think, on the interpretation of legislative history and what the framers wanted about the 14th Amendment in the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, in which there were lots of loyalty tests in different step baked into different statutes as the Union tried to be reconstructed, put back together again after the Civil War. And so the question is, was Jefferson Davis able to run for office after having left the Union and become the first president of the Confederacy? Would it have applied to him or not? There's a lot of debate, literally legislative debate at the time about its application to a rebel like uh, Jeff Davis. Uh, and that all applies here. The Supreme Court, we're getting the reports of the oral argument is trying to, I think they understand they got to make this decision before, well, before this particular election. Um, but there still seems to be a debate in the oral argument that's, that is, that's just wrong about what is the insurrection or rebellion. Um, because I can tell from some of the questions and answers that are being given that they're still focusing on Jan 6th and like, you know, were they armed? Weren't they armed? Did he control them? The, I'm talking about the people that attacked the Capitol, the more than 2,000 people. That is not the insurrection or rebellion for, for the 14th Amendment analysis. And everybody who's a constitutional scholar and everybody that's looked at the issue, like Michael Luddick, the former federal judge and Federalist Society lion, has said that. It's just read the provision. It's an insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution. And the Constitution was rebelled against and by Donald Trump when he refused to the peaceful transfer of power, not when he participated in one way or the other in giving the command to attack the Capitol. That's different. And but but it looks like they're all they're still kind of running through some confusing dialogue at the at the uh, Colorado Supreme Court level. But we'll report on that more in some hot takes. Ben and I'll pick it up on this uh, on the weekend edition of Legal AF because we've reached the end of the midweek edition of Legal AF. I do it every Wednesday for the last three and a half years with Karen Friedman and Nick Nippolo, and then every and for four years with Ben Mycel. It's hard to believe these these uh, this time has passed. Uh, only I can't on believe the it's been that time. long. Has it really been that long? Yeah, March will be four years. Uh, for what we call the beginning of Legal AF. It started as a weekend, week, uh, a legal roundup, legal update. I forgot what we called it. It was terrible. <laughs> whatever, whatever you can find it on YouTube, it's terrible. But it, that was the beginnings of Legal AF. It's like those early, it's like that first episode pilot of Star Trek, you know, from the 60s that they had to redo because it was, <laughs> because people didn't like it. And then we redid it and people, people liked it. Uh, but there's ways to support the show. First of all, where, where do you find us? right where you're watching, exclusively on the Midas Touch Network. Free, free subscribe. I never thought I'd say this number. Help them get that 2 million. Free subscribe, it's a crazy number. But they're gonna get there. They're gonna get there because you're gonna hopefully free subscribe because you like the content of shows like Legal AF and all the other podcasts that are on the network and content creators that are on the network. And that this is all free, what I'm talking about. Then go over to all the audio podcast platforms that you like, whatever, we're there. We're at every one of them. There's not one that we're not on. Go listen to us. That's all you got to do. It's free also. Listen, watch, watch, listen, same show. Watch the hot takes. Pick us up on the playlist on, my, on the my, uh, Midas Touch YouTube channel. All for free. It helps. This is the, We're on a platform, on a network that has no outside investors. It's grassroots. It, the, 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 that's it. We just we kind of run it the way we're running it. But we need audience support to do that. And that really comes in the way of eyeballs and participation and interaction and comments and thumbs up 
uh, and it all helps with the algorithm. It keeps us on the air, and that's what we that's what we ask for. Maybe one day we'll have a Patreon account. We've talked about it. Another way to do it. You can get some free exclusive stuff from the Legal AF leaders. We might try that in January with some other developments in Legal AF land. Uh, but for now, this is the way to do it. And then if you want to, you know, fly your flag of Legal AF, we have merch. <laughs> Here it is at store.midastouch.com. They're not free, but they're reasonably priced. We've got some great T-shirts. We got coffee mugs, I think, still, and some other things. With, and you can mix and match the logos with the T-shirt colors and the style and all of that. It's some amazing stuff. And then just you know, support us, the leaders of Legal AF, who collectively have I don't know seventy-five years of experience or more in the courtrooms that we talk about. Uh, you know, we do hot takes. You know, because. We have fast moving stories that can't wait until Wednesday and Saturday, and we want to do earlier. And we put these hot takes up on the legal, uh, on the Midas Touch uh, platform. Um, and if you want to find, well, I only like Karen. <laughs> That's fine. I only like Ben. But, but Popak, love Popak. You can go over to playlists and you'll find our body of work, our library of work for our individual hot takes about legal issues that are interest to, to us and we hope will be interesting to you. But this is the end of the podcast. Till next Wednesday <laughs> for Karen and me signing off. Shout out to the Midas Mighty and the Legal AFers. Mm-hmm.